So we're drinking beer because it's the final <laughs> keynote. Um, what could go uh, wrong? <laughs> this is us, uh, but let me first tell you why we are here. Um, Paul and I created this keynote after seeing another keynote at a big conference in Germany, which made me frown so much, <laughs> which made me angry, and which made me fill in the um, feedback form with the words, I do not know where to start giving you feedback. Please contact me and we'll talk about it. Because this person, and I'm not going to mention his name because it's not important, was talking about automation as the silver bullet. And it was not Paul, because Paul and I met on the way out. And before we left the room, <laughs> we were like, OK, we really need to find an answer to this. And this presentation is the answer to people who think you can automate everything and tools are the silver bullet and blah, 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 blah. That's why it's called automation addiction. We think many people suffer from automation addiction, and many tool vendors do too. So Paul, take it away. Who are you? I am Paul Holland. You've met me a few times already. Uh, the reason that Hybe and I are up here, and if you look at your printed programs, I'm Lena and he's Wilberg. Uh, <laughs> no, not, not true. Uh, unfortunately, Lena uh, came down with COVID. She is doing well. Uh, but uh, at, we only found out on Monday, I think it was, so Hybe and I were already going to be here, and Andre had seen this presentation uh, when we did it as a, uh, as a keynote at the same conference that Hybe was talking about the subsequent year, and so uh, we wish Lena well in her recovery, and that's why we're here. So. Uh, I am a senior test automation architect at Saxa Fifth Avenue, uh, based in New York. I work out of my home in Florida. I've been testing since 1995, and uh, I'm one of five rapid software testing instructors. Who are you? I am one of the other five rapid testing uh, testing instructors. Maybe the other four. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> what? Okay, never mind. Um, uh, I live in the Netherlands, started as a developer, everything we made broke, so I started looking for stuff to make it better, so I ran into testing, started out as a test automation engineer, and then moved my way up until uh, senior <laughs> VP level, and then I found out there are all psychopaths on the C-level, so I thought maybe I should focus on developing software and developing people, that's what I do, I coach and I train and I consult a lot. But enough about us. This is uh, a disclaimer. Yep. So before we start, let's, let's define what we're going to talk about. What is automation anyway? Because everybody has a different opinion. And I found this um, definition, which is, I think, one of the best I've ever found. It's adding more unreliable code to the stack of unreliable code you already have. Paul. So. When we talk about automation, it is often used as a specific term, but it's also referring to a wide variety of things. So it could be referring to an activity that you're doing. I'm not going to read them all. It could be referring to the level of code. Some people think automation is just at the unit level. Some people think it's only at the GUI level, and that unit level code isn't called automation. That's unit testing. Uh, could be uh, based on a workflow or architecture, anything like that. But the point is, to have a good discussion about automation, you must be specific. You must explain what you're talking about when you do automation. So um, by our own definition, we're not going to uh, being specific. So by our own definition, this will not be a good discussion. Sorry. Sorry, we apologize. So what is this automation addiction that we're talking about? I already um, lifted um, a tip of, of, of the, what is it in English? Iceberg? Iceberg. <laughs> Just look at this cartoon. Imagine this is this middle manager thinking about testing. If we automate all of our tests, then we should be able to replace all of our testers, right? Automation does what it's told. It won't talk back or ask a lot of annoying questions. I won't have to listen to the testers complain about the poor quality of our products anymore. Think of all the money we'll save. 18 months later, 
we walk into the office of the CEO of this beautiful country, uh, company. So how did we end up on the front page of the New York Times with our last release? We lost two billion in market value because of that one bug. Recognize that? Well, probably not because you're not CEOs, but these things happening, space shuttles exploding, stuff like that. Okay, so symptoms of automation addiction are trying to automate too much or everything. Seriously, it can be done. We'll talk about that later. Trying to maintain shit that isn't working because you worked so long on it. And let's just not throw away stuff because it might be helpful somewhere. Trying to replace testers. We have some great examples later of tools promising us stuff that's simply not true. You cannot replace all of your testers. You might replace some, but you cannot replace testing. Implementing problems because some senior uh, person likes the tool or system. I've been in that situation where I was senior VP and I was told to use that tool because, hey, that other person that, that he really liked uh, bought the license and let's use it. It was a useless tool and a very expensive useless tool. That hasn't happened to me since March. <clears throat> <laughs> the sunk cost syndrome, the, the example I already gave you. We spend so much time and money on this, let's not throw it away because we're throwing away so much money while you know it's not going to work. Or people that used to be great testers turn into software developers in testing, not knowing how to code, building shitty code and then trying to maintain it. I'm not saying that you shouldn't automate. Don't get me wrong. We're not saying we don't we, love automation. We it's, both like automation. Absolutely. When done right. But there's so much It's so bad rarely stuff done going right. on. So <clears throat> somebody in a class I took, uh, automating, automation in testing done by Richard Bradshaw and Mark Winteringham, said this, and I had to put it in our slides. So what started uh, this, well, actually, it was the talk that started this, but while Hybe and I were researching how to do this, uh, we kept coming across fairy tale marketing, or if you want to be more blunt about it, bullshit marketing. And uh, this one from Mind.K, there's seven benefits I've noticed myself that its automation is going to decrease costs, increase test coverage, improve test accuracy, improve tester morale. That's likely because they don't work for you anymore. <laughs> uh, faster delivery. Uh, OK, oh, maybe five could work. Uh, more hard to find bugs detected, the exact opposite of what automation will give you. And easy reporting. Fantastic. Thank you. And uh, Tricentis. Uh, don't take this personally, Ben. I know you don't speak for everybody. And this is also five years old, so there's a good chance that this guy doesn't work there anymore. But this SVP said that, um, uh, that the rapidly scaling automation uh, co testing costs in half and reduced timelines by as much as 90%. Ooh. Wow, that's a big number. 90% is a lot to cut my timelines by. Anyway, you get the idea. Smart Bear had the same thing. Uh, and this one was the funniest because we were legitimately online creating slides, and I got this email. And uh, he says, hey, I'm going to reduce manual testing and regression testing efforts by up to 60%, which is fantastic because he'd never met me or talked about, maybe I don't have any manual testing effort. You know the best way to reduce testing costs? Do less testing. It will also increase risk, though. Anyway, the point is, all of these fairy tale marketings are disturbingly um, incorrect. There's no baseline proof of them. And the people buying the tool at your company believe them. A lot of the people standing at the booths who have these on their, on their billboards believe them. The CFO of your company believes it. And then you are left trying to get the reductions in the costs, and you end up lying because you don't want to get fired because 
Everybody says it's supposed to reduce our costs and be easier, even though it often ends up being harder and more difficult. So as a result, and uh, it was Rob Sabrin who pointed this out, the lies get bought into at every level until the person implementing it also has to start lying to get these lies um, uh, essentially continue to be propagated. Remember we edit one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this one is by far the best. I forgot about this one. Yes. <laughs> QA Automator will get the automation cost for any business to absolute zero. Wow. That is impossible. <laughs> but thanks. I don't even think I responded to him. Okay. So why not automate everything? And I know I'm oh, preaching for I know the why. choir. I, I know I'm preaching for the choir because probably many of you already know. But if you don't, we'll freshen your memory up and maybe give you some um, ways to talk to your management if they think this way. Software is complex, very complex. And people who were in my uh, tutorial uh, have seen the slides before. It's very complex. There's Pe people in my tutorial saw this slide too. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so complex that there's nobody in your company who knows how the complete system works. It's just too big, too complex, too many lines of code, millions of lines of code. And we work with people, different kinds of people. They think differently. They have different behaviors. They're introverts, extroverts. They're people who think differently. And then they have to collaborate because we built software for people, with people. And that's kind of hard to do. But that's not everything. We also have emotions. So if you catch me tomorrow uh, uh, early, because then I've been playing Great Dalmuti, drinking a lot of whiskey, I might be in a worse shape than I am now. And I'm harder to talk to because I have a headache. And I don't want to talk about complex shit. So we have to deal with unknown unknowns. Things that we do not know that we do not know yet. And the only way to find that out is to do exploring, to do stuff that you've never done before, stuff that you might not think of, because again, it's an unknown unknown. Customers and product owners do not know what they want until they see it. So that's why build something, give it as fast as you can to these people, and then look at their reactions and learn from them and then improve the product. Your development team doesn't know how these customers actually use the software. So we need research, new insights, and evolutionary design to deal with this complexity and confusion. Yeah, I see. It's, sorry. You can have the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> new insights and a half uh, answers. So learn and deal with risks. Follow your slides. Oh, how about I talk about this one then? No, this one. This one. Oh. It is my slide anyway. <laughs> Story time. So I was uh, uh, d doing some consulting at a large American insurance company. And uh, honestly, they had one of the best automation frameworks I'd ever seen at a large company. They had a team that supported the framework. Uh, the framework had a lot of um, uh, abstraction in it so that if you were logging in, uh, and that login changed, you would only have to change it in one spot. They had a lot of automatic retry uh, built into their framework because the automation was executed overseas. There was a lot of network issues, uh, so they had this automatic retry. The framework was excellent. They had a large number of scripts, over 2,500 scripts, because they had a script for every written requirement. At this particular company, if you found a bug and there was not a written requirement that was being broken, you couldn't raise a bug. You had to raise a change request to have a requirement created, so then you could raise a bug against that newly created requirement. I am not kidding. Uh, about 40% of the scripts failed each execution, again, primarily because they were being executed overseas. Uh, on unreliable local networks overseas. Uh, they had 13 outsourced testers who would spend two weeks to execute the tests, re-execute the 40% that failed, re-execute the 40% of that 40% that failed, and then investigate every other failure. And on average, 
That team, 13 outsource testers, so just round it down a little bit, say one person year of effort a month, they would find six defects. So with one person year of effort, they would find on average six defects. I sat down for 20 minutes, pair testing with a, a, a test manager. Uh, so 40 minutes, one for, uh, round up, I'll say an hour. It was only 40 minutes, but I'll say one person hour. And we found five bugs, three of them were majors. So um, kind of an indication as to having a large number of scripts and a large number of people. And one of my recommendations for this particular company was to discard all 2,500 scripts, start again actually automating workflows instead of having an individual script for each item, and they wouldn't do it because of sunk cost syndrome. But Bo, but Bo. Oh no, <laughs> it's too scary. Yes. Okay, then my story. I was test manager for a huge project. We were building a life insurance huge. Uh, software uh, with over 100 people. I was the big test manager. I had 25 people in my team, of which three were full-time test automation engineers. And that tiny little bit of testing Paul had, we had 25,000 checks. That's automated. way more. They must have had at least 10 times the coverage because yes, they had absolutely. 10 times and, the and tests. And we were so happy with this whole automation pack. We even gave it to the developers. Like, please run this whole pack of tests before you deliver the software to us. And we were so confident that we would fall, we would find every single bug until that day that this man came up to me and said, are you the test manager? And I said, <laughs> sorry, sir, I am very busy finding this <laughs> enormous bug, which turned out to be the big director who I was reporting to, and I didn't recognize him. Um, 700,000 people received a letter with the wrong monthly amount to pay, which is a death fin in insurance business. You don't get the numbers wrong. What happened? We got overconfident. This bug was pretty obvious. If only one of my 25 testers or me had looked at the letter and said, hey, this can be wrong, this can be right. There's something seriously wrong, because you could compare them with the month before. It's easy to spot, seriously. At least it was only 700,000 people who got the letter. Could have been worse. Moral of this story is, even if you have the best automation, Please, just look at the big changes you're making and see if they're actually working <laughs> with your eyes, not with a computer. Maybe if you had the really good, you just called your automation the best. Yeah, it impressed. was the best in that company. Ah. <clears throat> so what automation can and can't do, if automation is done well, which it is not most of the time, but if it is done, I, I feel bad for her, she keeps having to switch back. It can allow for CI-CD pipelines to operate effectively. Faster delivery. That's why that one bullet said, oh, okay, I can't argue with that one. It will do or can do a good sanity check of the system. It's never going to go beyond sanity testing. It's not going to go exploring and learning and being insightful, but it can give you a sanity check, a couple of happy paths or even a lot of happy paths, but it's still just a sanity check. It will increase the frequency, or can increase the frequency, of those said checks. You can run them all night. The computer won't get tired. It might hunt you down later once it gains, uh, anyway. <clears throat> it uh, should be able to then free up your testers to not have to do the mundane, repetitive, low-level checks, and they can free up testers to do some good exploratory testing, look for deeper bugs, it will give you faster feedback to your changes if you have a good CI CD pipeline. Developer checks in code. A few minutes later, they get a response, or depending on how your code works, it could be a few seconds later. Uh, they'll get feedback saying that uh, your, your code is good or bad according to those checks. And you can also use it to do jobs that are uh, often error prone. So things that involve like a lot of data transformation or, uh, or other things typically wouldn't be part of your automation pipeline, but you can use automation to help you do tasks that are often repetitive and boring and error prone. 
It will also, and I don't believe I say this, but uh, at the last company I worked at, we actually did achieve this. We moved some testers into being automation testers, and we actually ended up having fewer exploratory testers uh, because a lot of what the exploratory testers had been doing was the low-level boring checks. So if that, those checks are being done, you could reduce the number of exploratory testers a little bit. I'm not saying replace them, I'm not saying get rid of them, but you might be able to reduce it. Uh, although, you'll probably need to replace them with at least as many automation testers. But, you get the idea. Uh, it can help with data collection, data input, and calculations. System monitoring, uh, especially in production, is very good with automation. And it can decrease certain risks. Some. Some. So, what can automation do for you if done poorly? And Which is most in, of the time. Yeah, exactly. That's our experience. There's Even a lot of bad experience. automation yeah. out there. Well, it will increase your costs. Because it's not working. You have brittle tests. You have to keep checking them. You come in in the morning. You want to look at the results. And 60% of your tests haven't run. That's a lot <laughs> of work to see why is it not working. And then you found one bug and you have to dive in to see where the bug came from. Execution time will increase because of that inf investigation of failures, what I talked about. All these false positives or false negatives or, or tests that do not run. Production coverage, uh, product coverage will decrease. If you've been in uh, Paul's uh, 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 tutorial about test reporting, uh, Paul uses mind maps and, and uh, color coding, and what he al already said, automation at its best can do sanity checks. But if you want to do deep testing, you have to go beyond that. And if you don't do that, so if you focus too much on automation and have a, a lot of, you need a lot of time to get, keep that running, your product coverage will decrease. So the chance of bugs escaping your attention will increase. It will demoralize employees. Just think of this job you have where 40, 40 uh, percent of your time, you're fixing your own shit. <laughs> it would demoralize me. I want to make steps forward, but no, we need to keep this framework that's not really working running. Or it trust in automation will decrease. So you will have a hard time uh, getting support from your team, which is also not good. And because of the decrease of product coverage, it will increase a lot of risks. So you'll get most of it, if you do it well, a decrease of certain risks, but if you do it not very well, the risks will increase. And I think that's a serious challenge. That was weird. I hit the <laughs> down button and it turned the screen off. <clears throat> so, and I didn't move my thumb. It was not a PIPSAC problem. Problem is between seat and keyboard. Anyway. Whatever you do, uh, what automation will not do for you. It will not replace the need for human testers. I think we already talked about that. We need people to explore, to find those uh, unknown unknowns, but also just to find stuff that only people can uh, evaluate. So it will not decrease your cost. I will say test automation will always increase your cost, which is by it's definition okay. not... It, it's it's, all, it's okay, because if you want a faster <laughs> delivery, because automation will give you faster delivery, then it might be worth the cost. But if anybody tells you, my tool, my thing will decrease your cost, kick him out. <laughs> and if it's a her, kick her out. It will not increase your product coverage ever. You need people for that. And it will not save your time. It will probably cost you more time. Again, the profits of having good automation are, all, are, are great. In, in, in pipelines, we need automated checks. It could increase your coverage. If you didn't have any testers and you had no other testing <laughs> yeah, and then and you created automation, you now have higher coverage. Yeah, you said ever. I had to. All right. You're right. <clears throat> Sorry. Lack of safety language. Problems here. with automation. So, what problems do we see with automation? Hybe and I have seen. A lot of problems in the consulting we've done at the companies we work at. 
a lot of times people just try to automate too much. They don't think critically about what's going to be automated, like at uh, the large American insurance company. Every written requirement had an automated test, whether it made sense or not. Some of them were very difficult to, to write. So uh, we recommend thinking about what's helpful. Uh, also thinking that more automation will find more existing bugs in the system on an ongoing basis. Once the automation has been executed, if it passed, if you execute it again, it should pass. If you execute again, it should pass. It's not a trick. It'll just keep passing. It's not going to find bugs that it missed when you run it more times. <laughs> That's not how automation works. It just looks where it did for the bugs. Uh, also, if you automate too much, you're ignoring the future maintenance costs. If you decide to automate a lot of things that are low priority, low risk, uh, low customer usage, uh, you're going to end up uh, drowning in maintenance costs on unimportant automation. But I can. You can. Don't do it just because you can. Oh, okay. Uh, also, I see automation being developed in silos. So you have a team over there working on a database. You have a team over here working on the front end. You have a team over there working on uh, something else. And they each develop their automation in silos. Or even within the front end, you might have a team in charge of uh, customer accounts when another team's in charge of checking out and another team, team is in charge of product availability and they each write their own automation and every time they write automation it's a new carriage on the train and the train becomes kilometers and kilometers long and takes forever to run instead of thinking about it logically. Oh, it's still me. Automating the wrong things. So. We also see that, uh, and I sort of mentioned this in the last slide, uh, uh, that you end up automating something because you have to, even if it's difficult. I worked at Alcatel uh, for 17 years, and one of the things we automated was the collection of data that went into a spreadsheet for what was called a rate reach curve. And a human could look at that curve in Excel and within seconds, like less than five seconds, determine if there was a bug or not. We roughly estimated how long it would take to automate that, and we guessed it would be about three months. How many five seconds of a human looking at it would you have to have for a three-month effort, let alone the maintenance costs going on and all the false positives or negatives? So we decided not to automate it. Uh, Automating things because you can, and I know Hybe can. If a test fails and no one fixes it, uh, then why did you automate it? How many people here have a test that just fails over and over again in your automation pipeline, and you never fix the problem, and you never change the automation? You've, one, wasted time automating it, and two, you're ruining the credibility of the automation by having a failure every day. People say it's red. I know why it's red. There's two failures today. Nah, it's red. Uh, so one thing you can ask is, if this test fails, is anyone going to care? And if the answer is no, then don't automate it. Uh, automating tests at the, at the uh, UI level, that should be automated at the lower level, because the lower you go, the, typically the more stable it is. And not having a good automation strategy, because if you have uh, a, a different, or if you don't have a good automation strategy, each team will have a different approach to automation, and that can cause uh, problems. And Connor talked about it in his talk uh, right before this, where uh, I think testing is a team sport and test automation is a team sport as well. But sometimes these people get siloed and start automating because they can or whatever, causing all the problems uh, Paul mentioned. So the sunk cost fallacy, we talked about it, so I'm, I'm going to be brief. But if you never throw away some part of your automation, you're doing it wrong. It's the same with your manual test scripts. I would throw them all away, probably. But sometimes, and I mean sometimes as in once every two sprints, some things become less important. So keep looking at your tests. Uh, checks your, your, your build and, and keep throwing some away. Because oh, it's not important anymore. Let's, let's get rid of them. Not stepping back, just sometimes go outside, 
grab a beer, put your legs on the table, and look at each other and say, okay, how are we doing? Is this still bringing value? And I worked with a team that did that. And my product owner looked at me and said, are you serious? Are you going away, are you going to throw away all test automation? Yeah, we found a better way to do it. So in the meantime, we're going to use it. But if this new framework is done, we're going to just throw it all away. And he looked at me like, but you know how much time we, yes, some cost fallacy, sir. We're going to do it. So not willing to start over with a better plan. Sometimes it's just better just to say, okay, this Selenium tool is not working for us anymore. We're going to use something different. Do it. Maybe not throw it away first. <laughs> that might be a better idea. But throw it away in, I don't know, a couple of weeks. So some other problems with automation. Ten minutes. Yes, I know. I have a watch. Written by unskilled or unmotivated people. I, we talked about it earlier. I see a lot of people trying to do automation without the necessary skills. And I'm not saying that you can't be an uh, automation engineer, but if you're a junior, have yourself coached. Do pair coding. Have uh, uh, long reviews with people who actually do, not, do know how to code. Because it's difficult. And your code will be very important. Because at one time, your company might not want to release software anymore before running these tests. And if these tests keep failing, that might be a problem. So test code is production code. So do code reviews. Do code static analysis, uh, uh, static analysis uh, for your code. Treat it as if it was production code. Scripts created independently by different teams because, well, we do this. This is my user story. I'll automate it. Some stuff. Paul talked about it. Look at the broader perspective. What kind of features or epics are you delivering to your customer? Automate those flows. Using a tool because it's the tool you know or the manager I told you about that makes you use this tool. Seriously, stop doing that. And automation being not part of the daily routine. In the current client I'm working at, we had a three-year project where they replaced the old framework with the new framework and they spend a lot of time creating all those tests. And then the, the, the guy who was doing the maintenance, I asked him, so how much tests do we run each day? He said, none. I said, why not? Well, we have 20 teams, and I do not know where to go if I find a test failing. So I just stopped running them. And I was like, seriously? We spent millions on this, and we're not using it? Well, yeah, that, we don't have a pipeline, and nobody bothers. And in the assignment before, they had a shitload of uh, checks, and they weren't running them because nobody felt responsible of checking, uh, checking in the morning or putting it, turning it on. It was not part of a pipeline. So if somebody said, let's run the tests, then they were run, and sometimes just nobody bothered, and they weren't run. So it's like having this Ferrari outside your door just being rusty because nobody wants to use it? Seriously, you I'll want that? I can't understand that. OK, I believe you. You do? I do. Oh, wow. But how do I convince my management about this? So we, Ivan and I, have over 50 years experience, and we have trouble convincing leadership to listen to these arguments. We often fail at convincing companies, but we've had some successes. So we're going to cover those successes now. Yes, we are old. So I'm not saying that we'll never be able to do it, but it's not a thing that I step into a management room and I said, hey, I'm going to convince you guys. That's <laughs> not how it works. Managers are seriously hard to convince. So maybe we should stop trying to convince managers, but try to convince our team because those are the people who are actually doing it. So don't try to convince them. Just do it. Start small. You don't have to ask for permission. I like to ask for forgiveness if they find out I'm doing it. Because most of the times, I just come back and say, hey, we tried this new thing. And look, this is what it brought us. Can we please take it further? Because then you've proven that it actually worked for your team. So you need willingness of others. It's all about repetition. 
So if you say it once and your colleague says it once and the team starts talking about it with management, then you might have success. Because it's hard to break an addiction. addiction. All right, so here are some things that we think will help you. Uh, ingredient one is keeping exploratory testing. I've already gone over this. Automation repeats the same checks. It doesn't test deeply. And uh, if you think of an Easter egg search where you go into a house, you look in the exact same places every single time, and then you leave, and then the next day you're still looking for Easter eggs, and you look in the exact same places again, are you going to find any new Easter eggs? No, you're not. But that's what automation does. See how quickly I did that one? Because we only have four minutes left. Awesome. Paul already talked about test strategy. Um, so do some risk analysis. Think about what's important and what's not important. What's important to automate, what's not important. So that might end up in reducing execution time, etc. So a good test strategy will help you overcome sunk costs, because you'll find out while talking about that test strategy that the stuff you're having is not bringing you value anymore, and you need something different. And that might help convince yourself to throw away the shit you're already having. Don't try to automate everything. If you automate too much, you'll have an extended automation time, extended maintenance costs. Uh, the scripts will likely not provide, or scripts never provide insight. Scripts just say pass or fail. To get insights, you need humans to do it. Uh, Automating checks that will never get fixed if they fail, don't automate them, covered that already. Um, don't lose the customer focus overview of testing. So uh, if you um, automate everything, uh, there's no human there to say, but a customer's not gonna do that, a customer might try to do this. So you wanna keep the customer focus overview of testing. And you can remind people of our two insurance company stories if, uh, that will help you. You can have this one. Thank I you, because you did steal a slide. Yes. All right, it's so what yours. are our takeaways? Robots can't replace humans uh, because humans have creativity. They can reason, they can think. Computers can't. Uh, what we do recommend is try to recognize you're getting into a bad situation early. It helps avoid sunk cost syndrome. It's a lot easier to throw away small amounts of automation than years worth. Uh, rem remember what we've said automation can and can't do. Try to convince the people locally around you and if you get uh, enough voices, maybe someone above you will hear. Don't try to automate everything and have a comprehensive test strategy. And if you don't know how to create one, there is an, uh, on the Automation University, a free online uh, website, uh, Angie Jones, who created the, the site, uh, she has a talk on how to create an automation test strategy. Ta-da! Thank you. Mike. With the mic. Mike with the mic. I mean, do you want me to read it or you're right <gasps> next to we it? We have an online question. It's from him. That's right. <laughs> he did it. So he says, if we're talking about transition from tester to automation tester, is automation a career or a tool or something else? You want to answer that? Okay, let me start. You start figuring out the question. I have to move my lips when I... No, it's fine. So is, is, is automation a career? Ah. Absolutely. Uh, sure. And, and, and do we need a specialist in automation? It depends on context. So... If there are testers in the audience who think they should be learning how to code, I have good news for you. You shouldn't. Not all of you. But some of you might. It depends on what kind of people you have in your team. If you have friendly developers, I try to bribe them with chocolate and beer. Because I can do a little bit of coding. I can read code. I can talk about code. I can help them create awesome unit tests. But I'm not the one you want to be automating tests. Martin is awesome in that, I'm not. But I bribe other people to do that for me. So for me, it's not a career. I'm way too expensive to do that probably. But for some, it might. And if you like it, do it. Because there's a golden future for you there, seriously. 
Everybody, every company is looking for great automation engineers. But if you're a great exploratory tester, that's okay too. The only advice I have for you is learn how to read code. Learn how to talk to developers, because you need each other. And if you start talking about objects and, and stuff they do, they might be interesting. So just sit next to them and say, hey, what are you doing? Tell me, explain me what you do and how you do it. That might bring you. So yes, it's a career for some, and it's not a, absolutely not a tool. We're using tools, so that's a, a means to do something. You yeah, want to add uh, something? I'd agree with that. O automation, uh, even if you're not writing automation that's going to be product level going in and executing in your CI CD pipeline, you can still maybe in Visual Basic and Excel, you can write a little routine that helps you parse your data better. It never has to be checked in anywhere, but understanding how to do some coding can help you, but I fully agree with Hybe. Some people just can't wrap their heads around coding. That's okay. If you're a good exploratory tester, focus on that. You should be okay. My guess is in the next couple of years is all these companies who have been going, let's automate everything, start ending up on the cover of the New York Times, more and more uh, exploratory testers are going to be sought after. I think we're kind of a, approaching, my guess is we're approaching a lull, the low, the lowest of the low demand for exploratory testing, and I think that's going to come back because automation cannot do it. <gasps> Another question on two. two. More questions. <gasps> and no one in, no one here? No? Okay, fine. All right. They have zero upvotes. Andre upvoted his own, so it had two. <laughs> um, good written automation for large... Oh, sorry, no, can't read that one. The other one got upvoted. Is automation useless if it is not guided by risk analysis? No, it is not. Uh, the uh, automation... Uh, the, the way I look at it, and I guess it's kind of risk analysis, but mostly you want to automate what's important to your company and what are the common flows that your customers are going to do. It's so, value analysis. Value analysis, even better than risk analysis in this case. Yes. Uh, you can use risk analysis to do it because what, if this one fails, again, I know at Alcatel we had one customer, we had, they had the same failure twice a uh, year apart, and they said, if this fails again, we're kicking you out. So we wrote automation to make sure that that didn't happen. Actually, it's not true. They wrote automation and they gave it to us. <laughs> and they said, execute this before you release. Uh, good written automation for large products is, a, is good for regression. Is impossible costly to manually cover all regression taste cases in a manual manner agree? Yes, I agree. OK. Let me explain why. I think we need automation for regression tests. Because you're humans, you're not robots. So you don't want to execute all those freaking same checks every sprint over and over again. But if you're enjoying it, then I want you in my team. Because <laughs> it, it, be, it could be done. I know a project where they don't have automation at all and they do manual regression testing over and over again. And they use the business to do that. How great is that? But that's not optimal. I think uh, good uh, teams spend some time on automating these checks you do over and over again. So, and especially if you have a large product, uh, you might want to have a lot of checks running on different levels, unit level, integration level, GUI level, etc. So yeah. All right. Any questions from the audience? Look. Oh, there we go. There we go. I'm not sure who's, Up front. Who, who said it, but... Uh, yeah, my question is, um, I'd advocate for balanced testers, so testers who have good exploratory testing skills, but also have an ability to automate at some level. Um, what are your thoughts on balanced testers as opposed to people <laughs> specializing in either side of the fence? I think we... <laughs> if you're willing to pay for a unicorn, you can hire all the unicorns you can find. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it seriously depends on, on context. It's a different mindset to be a good coder than it is to be a good tester. Although I know people who can do both. Me! But, but they are not very, uh, there are not many Stable. Of them. Stable. We're not very, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, they're, 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 no, never mind. Uh, a developer tries to write stuff to, to work and to show it can work, and whenever they write their automation, and again, very stereotypical, but 
uh, they, they write unit tests and they say, look, my code can do what it's supposed to. A tester's mindset is often, how can it not work and how might it break in ways that are important to our customer? So my goal isn't to show that it can work as a tester, my goal is to show it can't work, while the goal of someone who's written code is to show that their code can work. So it is a very different mindset. It's difficult to switch it back and forth. I much prefer the tester mindset, so I do less coding, but I can also do the coding. So, but it's, uh, if you can find people who, who can code and well, who can code well and are also good testers, uh, be prepared to pay well. <laughs> cool. Any other questions? Oh, one at the back. Oh, wow. Uh oh, it's Don't Martin. Prove. Martin, is he gonna? He's, he's gonna kill us. It's yeah. It's a. Uh, your talk is crap. Hi, Martin. That's something I only say privately. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate Thank you. that. Now I have more of a, of a comment. Uh, a lot of the auto this is also related to the term automation in testing rather than automated testing, because automation in testing is more about how can automation support the testing effort. Yep. And that does not have to be, here's a test case, automate it. And, Correct. And that also relates, uh, Hype, to your comment about value. Value can be in, let's have this uh, automation, this tool, prepare a test environment and not run any test, but just take away a lot of time that we are now spending as a tester or uh, doing sets stuff. Of, or create sets of data or... Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. so focus on where the value is indeed. Is that automated testing? Perhaps, perhaps not, but whatever, focus on where the value is. And in, in my workshop, I focused on different kinds of goals that automation can pursue and to yep. be clear about what the goal for your automation is. Yep. Yep. I believe the last script I wrote created 200 registered users on our system because I was not willing to do that manually. Stuff like that, yeah. Yep. And it Thanks. wasn't hard. How about that? Cool. All right. I think we are out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, now I'm going to switch. Ooh. You're switching? Are we doing that now? I don't know. Andre, hey. where do you go? Hey, Let's Paul, go. Do, you want me to, do you want me to introduce you for a closing speech or are you just going to wait? Uh, actually, I mean, as I don't know where Andre is right now, why don't you thank our sponsors before right we now, do what before? I... Yeah, now is a great time to do that. Okay, cool. And remind people to... Value to uh, value the oh, slides. First slides. I need to first show slides. slides first. Slides first. No, but you thank the sponsors first. Yeah. Right. Uh, oh, that's next year. Oh, it's not. A warm, warm thank you to everyone here and to the sponsors. Again, in no particular order, in the following order. <laughs> uh, thank you to Nagaro and Dava, Test Gear, Accesa, Epam, Frequentis. Big Time, Yonder, and all the other media partners for making this possible, for believing in this, for believing in testers, for making it, you know, bringing all of you together, bringing beautiful speakers here who are trying really hard to make slides pop up on the screen. Um, Just move this. So, yeah, thank you. Round of applause for, for all our sponsors. I don't know how Just, it works anymore. Just turn off the uh, Also, off the since, since we're here. Don't forget, on the little flyers here and on yeah, online drag this somewhere in some form, there's this little QR code here that you see. Um, please, please, please yeah, scan that because it's if you want, you know, future editions of this event to be as awesome as this one, nope. if at all possible, even more awesome, right. but I don't think so, um, we appreciate the feedback. That's a feedback form, and uh, we encourage Yay. you to, to, to scan that. Go there and tell us what you think. Tell us what you liked. Tell us you what you didn't like. So we can make this better and better and better every time. Uh, thank you. Without further ado. <clears throat> Thanks for filling the time of us getting the, that working. So, unfortunately, RTC 2022 is coming to an end. Just a few minutes left. But in these last few minutes, we're gonna rise your hopes up for another amazing conference next year, Romanian Testing Conference 2023, where... You click. Oh, I can, I can click. I don't know how to do this. No, I can't click. 
I just clicked. Nothing clicked. I lost my mouse. You've lost your mouse. There it is. We're a well-oiled machine. There it is. And our conference chair is going to be Lena Weiberg. And <laughs> Lena has joined us online. This could be interesting. To the right. Go to the right. Here we go. There's a delay. Watch. There we go. See? Lena on. There's a delay, so it's going to be weird with Lena, but here we go. Can we bring Lena onto the screen? Oh. Weird with Lena, but here we go. There she is. You're just going to be tiny in the corner, Lena. It's okay because your voice is really tiny for me. Well, um, my plan was to be there on stage with you, so I'm quite bummed that I'm at home isolating with uh, the virus, uh, but I'm really, really happy that uh, I can be there next year and beat Paul, because of course we've got to do next year better. Not willing to do any more 10 second pauses. So Lena, all right. I'm not willing to do any more 10 second that's pauses. Only so you cut her mic. You were going to do better than me. Anyway, uh, I that's think only that's because it, right? you said that you were going to do better than me. Anyway, uh, I think that's it, right? It's all in my. I don't hear those voices at all. Thank you so much, everybody, it's for coming. My, I hope I you had a great time. I hope you learned a lot. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. I hope you had a great time. I hope you learned a lot. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. I hope you had a great time. I hope you learned a lot. And I hope we'll to see you out. again next Thank year. Thank you very much. If Lena invites me. We'll find out. Thank you very much.